I now have the honor of introducing the newly named Kavli laureates in neuroscience, David Julius and Ardem Patapurian. Gentlemen, welcome both to this conversation and congratulations to each of you on this spectacular achievement, being the recipient of the 2020 Kavli Prize. Just want to start with uh, Ardem. You know, I, I'm fond of telling people that you never actually touch anything, right? When you grab hold of a glass, it's the electrons in your hand that are pushing against the electrons in the glass, and there's a separation between them, even though it feels that you have direct contact, sort of, that's my physics description of what the sense of touch is. As I understand it, you've gone like infinitely farther than that weak description at this intersection of both physics and chemistry, giving us insight into the nature of touch. Can you tell us about the work that you did that won the Copley Prize? Absolutely. Nice meeting you, Brian. Uh, it, it is really a great honor. And um, so our work is really started with the sense of touch. And indeed, uh, sense of touch does something pretty amazing, which is translates this physical force, you know, pressure and temperature into a language that cells understand and communicate with each other. In this case, either a chemical signal or electrical. Um, so we know a lot about how hormones, neurotransmitters talk to each other in cells, but we knew very little about how physical forces are communicated. Um, so David's work and, and my work has focused on this and we find in a way the biological sensors that take this physical force and translate it into um, chemical. So do you imagine that one day being able to use these insights to manipulate the way that we engage with the world, the kind of sensations that we have being brought under a more volitional control as opposed to just the random stimulation that we receive from the environment? Absolutely. With respect to, I was talking to someone who studies virtual reality in the form of video games and such, and they're saying that the tactile uh, version of this is the least understood, you know, and, and we have vibration, but that's about it. So I think uh, the whole engineering aspect of, um, of, of, of tactile science to the biological understanding might indeed come together someday. And so, David, your work, as I understand it, is in the related area, but you focus more on our sensations of heat and cold, how we respond to various chemical irritants. Is that accurate? And, and what has been the dominant focus of your research? Yeah, that's accurate. It really sort of... Um extends from our initial use of natural products to identify molecules that are involved in touch sensation. And, and really pain sensation is sort of what's driven um, a lot of components of our work over the years. Uh, and, you know, fascination of using natural products on just, you know, it's a really a great interface between uh, anthropology, chemistry, and neuroscience, understanding how we experience our world through natural products and how they can help us reveal endogenous systems within our own body that are involved in important physiological processes. And, and what um, sort of natural products, just, just to give me a sense, what sort of natural products? Uh, like capsaicin, which is the main pungent agent in chili peppers, um, menthol, which is the cooling agent in mint leaves, uh, these other sort of funky compounds called isothiocyanates and thiosulfonates, which are the things in wasabi and onions and garlic that, you know, elicit a sensation of a uh, of irritancy, I guess you would say, and um, and trying to understand how, why, and how all these activate neurons and molecules in our body that uh, generate a sense of you know pain and awareness of that. Ardem and David, you know, both of you have dealt with and are dealing with molecules that that communicate the sensation of pain, that transport that sensation in the body. In the best of all worlds. What do you think you might achieve with that going forward? Absolutely. I think if you look at um, pain treatments, we many assume that this is kind of a solved problem, but um, nothing can be further from the truth. There's some conditions such as neuropathic pain where there is very little out there that helps patients. And when there are drugs, they have some serious side effects of addiction. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the opioid epidemic now. And so we do need separate different classes of molecules that can help treat pain. And what David and I study, the peripheral nervous system is a perfect example of hitting molecules, for example, 
that are not in the brain, so targeting them would not have any of the downsides of uh, affecting addiction, et cetera. The molecules that we've identified uh, are important for us uh, in acute sensation, that is our ability to detect pain when it's useful and protective. But one of the other great aspects of our work is that it tells us about how these molecules are involved in pain that's not so protective, like chronic pain, when it becomes more debilitating and not as, as useful as a warning system. One of the big goals is to really use this information to develop a new spectrum of analgesic medicines that can be used uh, in, in, a, in adjunct to or in replacement for current um, uh, pain drugs. You know, as, as science faculty, we all teach students, and I think one of the most important things for students to realize is that even the most highly accomplished scientists, as you both are, have had moments of doubt, moments when things weren't going as well as they would have hoped. Do you have any moments of that that you'd be willing to share? Because I think it's valuable, if you do, for students to, to hear that. Yeah, I think it's important for students to know that er almost everybody in their careers, except for a blessed few, have had times when, uh, um, you know, long valleys when they're looking for peaks. You know, most of what we do is failure. A small part of it is success. And, um, and there's a, most of the things that you try in the beginning don't work. I think it's important for students to know that, that's, that everybody has their moments of excitement that can be uh, brief, sometimes extended, but um, a lot of the times you're just sort of trying to be patient and work through a lot of problems and get to where you need to get. Yeah, I can, I can second that actually during the same period postdoctoral fellowship. I had some serious doubts thinking, you know, I'm working super hard, not getting too much interesting data, not making any money. And uh, I start looking into other lines of science related work such as consulting and things like that. But I'm so glad I um, decided to stick with science because I think it's the best job in the world to be a professor. You go into lab and work with brilliant young trainees to explore the mysteries of the universe. And, and then once in a while, without you applying, someone nominates you and you get an award like Kavli. What else can you ask for? Exactly. Well. It's been fascinating to speak with both of you. Congratulations on the award. And more important than that, the best of luck and continued success in going forward in research that has the potential to really impact the way we live. So great to meet you both. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much.